good evening good evening ladies and gentlemen it's a privilege and honor to be a part uh, um, and also moderating this extraordinary session on osa in fact yesterday professor sinivas kishor sir discussed various topics as part 1 of osa and uh, it is so nice that he has agreed to give four sessions exhaustive sessions on this excellent topic which is very less understood by many so as you know royal pearl hospital here we are doing you might wonder why is this guy doing he is not connected it with it i am telling you this is just as a mediator i am just working as a mediator to bring the best people around the world to teach and they are all my friends and they readily agree to teach so that is the biggest uh, thing i have gained over the past 20 years i have gained good friends and the friends teach out of love and from their heart yesterday you saw it so i don't have to tell anything and i received so many calls from all over the world okay without much ado today we are going to have the part 2 of osa and this will be again available in royal pearl youtube channel and uh, today we are going to discuss about the cpap therapy and how to improve outcomes and here we are with the dawn of osa professor srinivas kishor sir over to you sir thank you very much for your kind words and uh, welcome everybody to this again which is going to be a very exhaustive session so brace for it uh, today we are going to talk very interesting topics the first thing we are going to talk about is uh, a continuation from what we spoke yesterday yesterday we spoke about basics the pathophysiology we spoke about once a patient walks into your clinic how you are going to take history how you are going to evaluate the patient's facial profile the malocclusions the airway and then we spoke a little bit about how to read a, a sleep study different way formats so now we are we are poised at this very beautiful situation where now you have to decide on how you are going to treat this particular patient now in order to treat the particular this patient of obstructive sleep apnea we need to do certain formalities which are mandatory or almost considered gold standard in the evaluation of obstructive sleep apnea so now we are going to start with our lecture which is drug induced sleep endoscopy and we are going to talk specifically about the usefulness of drug induced sleep endoscopy for the planning and prognostication not only about of multi level surgery in the management of obstructive sleep apnea but you will also understand how drug induced sleep endoscopy is now coming to uh, help us to treat other modalities of treatment which is to improve outcomes in cpap therapy in mandibular advancing therapy and a positional therapy now as you know dear colleagues obstructive sleep apnea is a condition caused by partial or complete obstruction of the upper airway and unfortunately it doesn't happen at a single level it happens at multiple levels and if you really look at this beautiful article that has come in lancet respiratory medicine and this is a this is just to sort of show the global burden of uh, sleep apnea the numbers are staggering and according to this particular report that has been published in lancet they suggested that 1 billion adults aged between 30 and 69 worldwide could have obstructive sleep apnea and the number of people with moderate to severe sleep apnea 
for which treatment is generally recommended is 425 million people. So there is no dearth of patients. There is so much sort of uh, uh, requirement out there that all of us should actually pull up our socks and take up managing these particular patients. And this is published data in Lancet. Now, as we all know, that PAP therapy is the gold standard in the management. Yes, it is the gold standard of management. And the biggest problem we know, whether it is the latest device, the AirSense, as you can see in the, uh, which is uh, uh, a very, very compact device, or this beautiful dream station by Philips, no matter how sleek it looks, or how beautiful it looks, the problem still remains that compliance and treatment adherence is one of the biggest issues with gold standard therapy. And yesterday, those of you who have missed this particular data, I will bring this up again to show that no matter how beautiful the CPAP looks or how sleek they have made it, adherence is still uh, abysmal 39% at the end of six months. And this is another beautiful paper that has been published uh, by a dear colleague of mine, Brian Rottenberg. This graph basically talks about the trends of CPAP adherence over 20 years, okay, right from 1996 to 2010, 2011. In 1996 also, the adherence has been 40 to 50 percent. And at 2010, 2011 also, the, the adherence rate is the same. What does this tell you? Does that tell you that the, that the machines have remained static? No. As I will talk to you in the subsequent lectures, lot of technologies have come in. Lot of techniques have come in. Lot of interfaces have come in. What is an interface? Interface is the mask. Basically, you call it in a posh term called interface. In common man's terms, it is mask. There are many kinds of masks that have come in from 1996 to 2010. And now also, there are so many new masks that have come in, but the adherence is still the same to the gold standard therapy. So the problem is that people are not able to use or will not use the gold standard therapy for various reasons. So if you really look at uh, and dig a little bit uh, of about, and all of you now know about real world data and uh, real world data is uh, data that is not come out of studies that are uh, custom made for a particular uh, uh, study. It's not your study or my study. It is real world data. This is data that is out there from insurance companies or from health systems. And in terms of uh, this beautiful article that has come out, it has now slowly uh, shown that, you know, uh, even in the real world, the, uh, the adherence not, has not changed too much. And uh, this is a beautiful article that has again been published in JAMA. This is a, a, a beautiful article that has been written by, uh, published by a dear friend from Australia, Stuart Mackay. And here uh, it has shown, uh, the, the title is the effect of multi-level surgery versus medical therapy on AHI, which is the, uh, the gold standard metric of measure. And in conclusion, in this preliminary study of adults with moderate to severe sleep apnea in whom conventional therapy has failed, combined palatal and tongue-based surgery combined compared to medical therapy has reduced the number of apneas and hypopnea events in, at six months, which again is telling us that you don't have to sit with your head low thinking that, okay, I have failed gold standard therapy. What is next for me? You don't have to feel bad about it, dear colleagues. This is, this is a randomized control trial, and this is published in 
in in in a very very reputed journal which is jama so there, there is a lot of hope out there for patients who have failed gold standard therapy which is cpap so there is literature after literature after literature again this is another beautiful paper and this is again come and published in jama and this is not from any simple uh, uh, group this is from the stanford group again suggesting uh, that soft tissue surgery for osa was associated with lower rates of development of cardiovascular neurological endocrine systemic complications compared with pap prescription in a a large convenient sample of working insured us adult population so dear colleagues the data is all out there things are now coming up papers are being coming up showing that there are alternatives in the form of surgical uh, treatments for um, obstructive sleep apnea if the gold standard therapy fails now unfortunately there is no book something like this which is a you know cure for sleep apnea without pap all these papers that i have just quoted there is they have not read this book that and said that okay i'm going to read this book and i'm going to do some particular procedures and we are going to succeed no unfortunately there is no such book and we have clearly in 2023 came beyond this particular uh, thought process that i am going to either give cpap for everybody because i am a respiratory physician or because i am a trained sleep surgeon i will do surgery for everybody no we have completely moved from that basic concept as a treating uh, person we are going to give all kinds of treatment mod qualities that are out there we are going to show this plethora of treatments that are out there for each particular patient personalization is a mantra osa is a journey at any particular point in time your patient might need a surgery the patient might benefit from a surgery with positional therapy surgery with mandibular advancing device yesterday dr shilpi was asking about upper airway stimulation yes that is also there so the 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 treatment options for the obstructive sleep apnea patient is like a supermarket he can actually go there and with our help can pick up the right treatment option for him and go on with this journey of obstructive sleep apnea but how do you select these things how do you select whether surgery is the right thing for this particular patient whether positional therapy is the right therapy for this patient or mandibular advancing device is the right treatment for this particular patient you are at the crossroads as a treating patient with, uh, as a treating physician and you don't know what door to open so again like i said yesterday evaluation 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 now there are many kind of evaluation techniques whether there are uh, they it may be awake evaluation techniques there are sleep evaluation techniques but what is the right or the best evaluation technique yes we would like to be non invasive as possible but if you just to go by the severity itself if you do a sleep apnea study i mean a polysomnography can you decide what is best for your particular patient no unfortunately even though the advantage of not doing an extra test uh, uh, just the decision making based on sleep study will not bo uh, tick box your needs because it is not accurate it does not support there it is not supported by evidence and even though we have some loose data that says that the higher the ahi the lower the airway obstruction that means the higher the ahi 
the bigger the tongue base or the high, there's a very high chance of tongue base obstruction or there is a very high chance of epiglottic obstruction. But what is the proof for that? There is no data to support that. So, but is doing is uh, a sleep study just a trash? No, it's not. In fact, a sleep study can tell you whether a patient may have positional sleep apnea and also it will give you an idea whether in post-surgery, whether the patient needs to go into a high dependency unit, whether the patient might go into some kind of a, or a proper ICU. Why? Because we know now that the higher the AHI, higher the oxygen desaturation index, the more chance that the patient may develop post-operative complications. So the sleep study not only tells you the need for treatment and urgency for treatment, the, patient, the sleep study also tells you whether the patient is going to be safe in the immediate post-operative uh, uh, stage, whether you want to put him in a high dependency unit or just a post-operative room. Now, yesterday I was also talking to you about Friedman position and how it tells you uh, or it tells you whether a particular procedure is going to be successful in your patient or he's not going to be successful in your patient. Just to brush up from yesterday, yesterday we spoke about Friedman staging, which tells you that a UPPP or a modified UPPP may be successful only in stage one, but it won't be successful or your success rate is going to be abysmal if as the stage goes up. So we know by this particular uh, slide that uh, this staging is of no value to you because patients don't come with a forehead sticker saying that I am going to be Friedman stage one and I am going to get this procedure done. This is the new Friedman classification that I didn't speak to you all about and I thought I will tell you about this today. The stages two have been split into 2A and 2B. This is for you postgraduates. Some crazy guy like me might come in your exam and ask you what is Friedman stage one and Friedman stage two. And this is for you. I will also share this later if you want to as a separate uh, uh, a picture if you are interested. But it is important that you know that Friedman stage position, tongue position has been divided again into A and B. Now, why am I talking to you about all this? We know now that evaluation in sleep changes the treatment choices in 40 to 75%. Please remember that evaluation of sleep changes the treatment choice in 40 to 75% of the patients. But does this change the treatment outcome? That is something that we are going to discuss in these subsequent uh, uh, slides. Now, there is a lot of, lot of interest. If you really look at the number of papers that have been uh, published so far on drug-induced sleep endoscopy, this from 2016 till date, it has come down a little because of two years we lost during COVID. Otherwise, the number of papers that are being published on sleep endoscopy only sleep endoscopy is just towering year by year. So what is sleep endoscopy? Now, we can't go into people's bedrooms and pass a small camera into the nose while they're having natural sleep. It is just impossible because even though you, and one is you cannot anesthetize the people's nose and then put a small scope you all of us know we all do diagnostic nasal endoscopies. We know how much we have to anesthetize the nose to do a simple nasal endoscopy. Imagine you are doing a complete airway assessment. It is not possible to do it during natural sleep. So in order to understand the behavior of the upper airway during natural sleep, 
we perform this particular test called drug-induced sleep endoscopy. Why do we do that? Because now we know that in about 75% of the patients, once we do a drug-induced sleep endoscopy, even though we follow the Friedman staging or whatever staging that we do, the moment we do drug-induced sleep endoscopy, voila, you are going to change your treatment plan. Now, drug-induced sleep endoscopy is a snapshot of the upper airway three-dimensional anatomy, which is pharmacologically induced in a short time. Each of these words are very important, and hence I'm going to say it again. Snapshot is very important. Dynamic assessment uh, is very important. Pharmacologically introduced is very important. So we are trying to understand the behavior of the upper airway in a pharmacologically introduced sleep in a snapshot in time. But that itself is enough to change your treatment choice for this particular patient. Now, a lot of us would, uh, uh, would have this confusion as to, should we do drug-induced sleep endoscopy instead of a sleep study? No. Sleep study assesses pathophysiology. Drug-induced sleep endoscopy talks about pathology in a very less uh, uh, perspective. It talks mostly about anatomy. Yes, now we know more and more with drug-induced sleep endoscopy that we are trying to understand pathophysiology as well. But in terms of this particular talk and the kind of audience that we are trying to address, I think let's not go there. Drug-induced sleep endoscopy gives you anatomy. Sleep study gives you physiology. Understand that. So, where does drug-induced sleep endoscopy fit in? Drug-induced endos uh, sleep endoscopy fits in if the gold standard therapy, which is the PAP therapy, is, has failed or is not able to be uh, given to a particular patient. So in that particular scenario where the gold standard therapy has failed, your drug-induced sleep endoscopy comes in to try to help which is the next best treatment that will be the right option for you. That is where this particular uh, treatment mod, uh, evaluation comes in. Now, all of you would immediately ask, it is drug-induced sleep endoscopy. How is it even same as natural sleep? So there have been lots of studies that have come in and said, that if you were to do a polysomnography of a patient today, and you do a polysomnography with propofol the next day, you would know that the parameters in terms of measures like AHI particular slide, if you look at the same patient, if you do a, a sleep study with, and the end result in terms of AHI is 16, and you do a polysomnography assisted propofol induced sleep, and you measure the AHI, for this particular patient, they are the same. So what is this telling you? This is basically telling you that whether this is a drug-induced sleep or a natural sleep, the disease burden has basically come out to be the same. So this tells you that we are not actually overscoring your, your study in terms of pathophysiology. I hope I'm clear. So where does drug-induced sleep endoscopy come in? It comes in after the gold standard therapy has failed. And if you want to take the next step to venture into how best you want to treat your patient in terms of the next best modality of treatment, it may be surgery, it may be uh, positional therapy, it may be a mandibular advancing device. Next step, how sure are you 
that you are not over sedating and over scoring your patient and causing more apneas? No, it doesn't happen. We know that when you do a polysomnography uh, with propofol, in terms of the disease burden, the numbers are the same. So you are not going to do any injustice to your patient. Now, what are the indications and contraindications? The indications are, we already know, DICE is indicated when surgery or mandibular advancing device is being chosen as a treatment option. And also, you have had a patient who in, in your hands or somebody else's hands, surgery has been done and it has failed. And you want to know why it has failed, you do drug-induced sleep endoscopy. Not only that, you have a pap therapy failed patient and you want to know why it has failed, drug-induced sleep endoscopy is the investigation for you to go to. Are there any contraindications? No, there are no absolute contraindications, but there are certain relative contraindications. Please remember that obstructive sleep apnea is a syndrome, right? So if you have a patient with a lot of comorbidities and the AHI is very high, above 70, and there is a severely obese patient, probably with a lot of CO2 retention in this particular patient, you need to be a little careful than somebody probably who has an AHI of about 30 or 40 and whose probably BMI is 26 or 27. So there are relative contraindications, but there are no absolute contraindications. So is this uh, like any diagnostic nasal endoscopy or is this like a stroboscopy that you do? No. Drug-induced sleep endoscopy, when you do for a patient with obstructive sleep apnea, requires a pre-anesthesia checkup. One, he does require these particular prerequisites. What are these prerequisites? You, as a treating physician, should have certain particular invest, uh, uh, sort of setups in your uh, own setup, whether it's a hospital or a clinic. You should have basic cardiorespiratory monitoring. You have to have BP monitoring. You should have ECG monitoring. Please remember that these patients may have oxygen requirements suddenly while you are doing the procedure. So you need to have a, a facility where you can give oxygen immediately if the need arises. You may also need to have a bispectral index scoring system. Now, what is a bispectral index scoring system? A bispectral index scoring system is a scoring system wherein you are, but this is a, a particular device which I will show you in the subsequent slides, wherein it's a, it, it takes all the data from your frontal EEG and it compiles and gives you a particular data. Now for the noise ENT surgeon, what does, what does it mean? It basically means and it gives you your depth of sleep or depth of sedation. That means the deeper, the, the lower the number, the deeper the patient's sleep is. That means supposing a particular patient's BIS score, let's say is about 60, that means this particular patient's sleep is N2 sleep. And I have a slide that shows you each BIS scoring to their particular stage of sleep. So as a treatment, as a treating doctor, you should have all these particular prerequisites with you before you start a drug-induced sleep endoscopy. So what is the technique? Because this is doing, this is almost, and this is called unconscious sedation. Please remember this particular word, unconscious sedation and conscious sedation. These are terms that we use and I will be using in the subsequent uh, uh, slides wherein the patient becomes unconscious, it is sedated. Is this anesthesia? No. But 
since it's unconscious sedation, the patient has to show up to you nil per oral. You need to give an anticholinergic like a glycoperylate half an hour before you do your drug-induced sleep endoscopy. Why so? Because allergic rhinitis is a very common comorbidity for obstructive sleep apnea. And if your patient has got allergic rhinitis or any kind of non-allergic rhinitis and he produces copious amounts of secretions and while you do your drug-induced sleep endoscopy, there are a pool of secretions in the, uh, in the nasopharynx or in the oropharynx and you have to suck it out. One, it becomes very difficult. You will have to bring the patient into lighter planes of uh, uh, sedation and hence, it will take longer time to do the procedure because the patient is coming back every time you're sucking the secretions, the patient is coming into lighter planes of sleep. And then again, you have to wait for the patient to go into deeper planes of sleep. So to overcome all these issues, just do or give glycoparylate half an hour before doing your procedure. A topical anesthetic is very important because the nose is very sensitive, but the topical anesthetic shouldn't be too much so that it flows into the nasopharynx and blocks your pharyngeal receptors because blocking the pharyngeal receptors will change the, the muscle responsiveness and you may be overscoring or underscoring the, your sleep study. I hope I'm clear. I will tell you this again. If you give a topical anesthetic in the form of a 4% xylocaine or a 10% xylocaine, make sure that this anesthetic does not go into the nasopharynx or oropharynx. If it does, the problem is that it will cause the muscle responsiveness because, see, you need to understand that the whole upper airway is such an intertwined uh, system. There are, with every single sensory input, there is a muscle responsiveness in terms of the, the way your genioglossus or the way your pharyngeal muscles are opening the upper airway. So if you anesthetize your pharyngeal receptors, the input is not good. So the output in terms of the airway opening may be different and hence you may not get a good understanding in terms of a drug-induced sleep endoscopy. And obviously you can't do drug-induced sleep endoscopy with rigid scopes. You need to have a flexible scope and you should have a recording with acoustic signals and visual signals being recorded simultaneously. Why so? Because you want to differentiate an apnea wherein there is no sound coming in to snoring where there is a partial airway obstruction. And you record all this so that you can sit with your patient after the procedure and discuss the drug-induced sleep endoscopy in detail. Now, please pay attention to this particular slide wherein very clearly I'm talking about the three most common drugs that we use in drug-induced sleep endoscopy. The pers my personal favorite is propofol, and I will talk to you about it. Midazolam has completely gone out of uh, uh, flavor, and dexmedetomidine, which is the uh, new kid in the block, there are advantages and disadvantages for each one of them. And those of you who would want to um, uh, take a picture of this, there is also this particular slide in the OCNA that I shared in the, uh, in the group. Um, so you can use this uh, particular uh, slide. If you want to take the picture, you're more than welcome. I want you to share uh, and have an understanding of the pharmacokinetics and pharmacological properties of the drugs that we use. Now, this is a way to deliver this particular drug. There are commonly used three techniques. One is the bolus technique. Two is the pump infusion technique. 
and three, which is the target controlled infusion technique. Target controlled infusion technique is not easily available in India. So you can use the bolus technique or the pump technique. And uh, very clearly there are, uh, there are ways and means how you can use each of these techniques here. So you can take a picture of it or um, you can download it later also. But uh, this is the way that you can use each of these techniques when you do, uh, when you choose a particular drug for your drug-induced sleep endoscopy. Now, how does propofol, how are you supposed to differentiate or you need to understand which is your favorite drug? Is propofol your favorite drug or is dexmeritamidine your favorite drug? How are you supposed to sort of pick up between these particular uh, drugs that are out there? So there are lots of uh, data and I've sort of uh, chewed it down for you to give you the most digested product here. So to compare uh, each of these drugs, patients with propofol group had significant increased likelihood of demonstrating complete tongue-based obstruction. Now, why does that happen? Propofol inherently has the capacity to decrease muscle tone of the most important dilatory muscle of the upper airway, which is the genioglossus. And hence, you will be seeing a tongue-based obstruction more often when you do propofol as opposed to when you use dexmeditamidine. But is dexmeditamidine the best drug? Not really, because dexmeritamidine again comes with its own bunch of problems. What are they? One, if you ask any of us who are actively doing this particular practice, it takes a hell lot of time to sedate the patient with dexmeritamidine. Somehow, this drug, even though takes the patient in, in terms of sleep depth to a beautiful stage of sleep, somehow it does not have the same effect on the respiration. So what happens is no matter how deep your BIS number is going, dexmeritamidine has some kind of a respiratory parameter protection nature. So the patient's BIS is going down, that means the sleep stage is going down, but the patient's saturation remains the same. So how have you, and for you, as somebody who's performing the drug-induced sleep endoscopy would be wondering how to evaluate because the bus is, uh, the bus is going down, the patient's sleep is going down to N2 or N3 sleep, but the patient's saturation is not going down, so you are stuck. This is the biggest disadvantage with dexmeritamidine when compared to propofol. Again, this is another uh, beautiful data that's come out comparing dexmeritamidine with uh, propofol, suggesting that dexmeritamidine tries to give this kind of a cardiorespiratory stability, but propofol does not give that kind of stability. But dexmeritamidine does not give you that stage of oxygen desaturation that you would like to see while you're doing drug-induced sleep endoscopy. So is there a perfect drug? Whether it is, is propofol the perfect drug? Is dexmeritamidine the perfect drug? There is an answer for that. You can actually start off with dexmeritamidine and then you can give boluses of propofol to maintain that particular level of unconscious sedation based on your BIS. So use your BIS or the, your clinical acumen. Keep giving propofol, I mean, keep giving dexmeritamidine as a continuous infusion and keep giving boluses of propofol. Keep, keep that BIS number anywhere between 50 and 70 so that you are not overscoring or under, uh, underscoring and 
you can do your drug induced sleep endoscopy beautifully with the help of both of these drugs like a cocktail right now again this is a beautiful paper that uh, our colleagues from pgi have published dexmedetomidine versus propofol at different sedation levels and they concluded that dexmedetomidine shows lesser degree of airway collapse and higher oxygen saturation levels at greater depths during dies propofol has faster onset and emergence from sedation so even though all those papers that i spoke to you about are in favor of propofol showing that propofol gives you respiratory depression propofol gives you more muscle collapse but propofol gets you where you want to get very quickly and it gives you all the respiratory desaturations that you want to see very quickly and unfortunately even michael jackson sort of went into propofol and i wanted to try propofol and experimented with propofol and the rest is history and all of you know that so each of these drugs have their advantages and disadvantages so my preferred cocktail is dexmedetomidine infusion followed by boluses of propofol so this is bis dear colleagues this is by medtronic and this is how the setup is you get these disposable stickers which uh, you need to put in the forehead because once you put this sticker it it doesn't cost too much it costs about uh, 2500 rupees per sticker so it's a good investment and you can also reuse it if uh, you can put some jelly uh, uh, ultrasound jelly and you can uh, reuse this so this is a simple example just to show how bis is important this is the patient this is the bis score and you can see uh, how the patient is in this beautiful sweet spot and we are not overscoring you are not underscoring you are you have to be anywhere between 50 and 70 because each one of this bis value correlates to that particular stage of sleep so here is what you look inside what is happening inside this particular patient so here you can see at you are sitting at the level of the uh, posterior quinae and we are looking at how the soft palate is collapsing you are looking at how the whole airway is vibrating and i will explain uh, how what are the, all the different patterns of obstruction this is just for you to get the gist of how it looks inside the box the box being or uh, the tube being your upper airway so here we are at the level of the palate here now just at the beyond the palate this is the oropharynx at the uh, 12 o'clock position you are seeing the epiglottis and posteriorly at 6 o'clock position you are looking at the arytenoids and you are just trying to understand the different levels or just the behavior of the upper airway okay this is how it basically looks now this is an other video much more clearer now earlier you saw only vibration now i'll just play this particular video and you can see earlier video you saw the particular uh, direction of collapse was side to side and see here this particular collapse is happening anteroposteriorly okay now as the patient is breathing you can see that the airway is collapsing like this but yet some amount of air is going through don't worry i'm going to talk a lot a multiple videos i'm going to show you today this is again just to show you how it looks inside just for you to understand the structures that you are basically seeing 
Now you can see these are salpingopharyngeal folds. This is the soft palate. This is the uvula. And you can see how with every breath, the collapsible airway is coming together and causing an obstruction. So this is just for you to understand what's going on. Now, beyond the soft palate, you see the oropharynx is coming from side to side and causing a problem. So this is the uvula. This is the oropharynx. So you should not get confused between the level of the oropharynx and the level of the soft palate. As we see many videos, as I'm going to show you, you will understand how and each one of these levels you'll be able to identify and score them as well. Now, now this is another video, if you can see. See, the, this particular video, if you can see, the airway is obstructing, just wait for it, in a circular fashion. The first video, you saw it was coming from side to side. The next video, you are seeing that it was coming in an anteroposterior direction. And this video, you are seeing it is like a purse string. And as the video goes on, you will see It's see the entire airway collapsing. And then you can see at a particular level that it slowly the amplitude goes down. Now, we've seen a few videos. Now, once before we go into scoring other uh, particular videos, we need to know what we are talking about. Now, the commonest or the most uh, commonly used classification is the vote classification. Vote is basically a, 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 uh, an abridged version of V-O-T-E. Now, vote classification represents a common language to describe the patterns of obstruction during drug-induced sleep endoscopy and may ultimately direct treatment interventions. Now, what does each one of these vote actually mean? V means you're talking about obstruction at the level of the soft palate, obstruction at the level of the uvula, or the lateral pharyngeal wall at the level of the velopharynx. What is velopharynx? That part of the soft palate that touches the posterior pharyngeal wall is the velum or the velopharynx. The next level in terms of V-O-T-E is oropharynx means lateral pharyngeal wall, including tonsils. The next step is tongue base, and then the next step is called epiglottis. Now, all of these contribute to the multiple levels of obstruction that signifies obstructive sleep apnea. So, velum, oropharynx, tongue base, and epiglottis. It is not necessary that all of them should be there. It may be different permutations and combinations. Now, once you identify the different levels of obstruction, you should be able to next score them based on whether it, there is no obstruction at each of these levels, or there is a partial obstruction at each of these levels, or a complete obstruction at each of these levels. For example, the first video we saw, 
there was an obstruction coming from side to side at the level of the velum. So we call it a lateral obstruction. And was there a complete blockage or a partial blockage? There was a partial blockage. There was no complete blockage. Hence, you will call this a one. The oropharynx cannot be at three levels like the velum. It can't be AP, it can't be lateral, it, uh, uh, it can't be uh, uh, concentric. It can only be side to side, which is the lateral pharyngeal wall along with the tonsil. The third one is tongue base. The tongue base can be only anteroposterior and it can be either not obstructing or partially obstructing or completely obstructing. The next level is the epiglottis. It, it could be either anteroposteriorly collapsing like a lid or laterally collapsing from side to side. So this is the commonest or the most universally used classification when you use, uh, when you want to score drug-induced sleep endoscopy. Now, there are other classification systems that have been there. The, uh, this is something that has been published by Vic V from the UK, uh, wherein there are uh, multiple things that have brought into um, uh, picture here. But to me, the easiest and the most universally used is word classification. But as uh, people who want to use uh, uh, drug-induced sleep endoscopy to treat your patients of obstructive sleep apnea, it is important that you know all the newer classifications that have been come out. But no other classification has been validated like the word classification. We also have sort of come out with that, which is going to be published, which is the comprehensive classification, which uh, we are going to publish. All the data is ready. It's uh, uh, It's been submitted and uh, we are waiting for it uh, to be tweaked a little bit so that it, we can go in for publication. And this is our, uh, 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 the way we would like to classify our drug-induced sleep endoscopy, but it's not yet published, but it's going to be published very soon. So, based on the data that is out there, if you look at the levels of obstruction. Dr. Srinivas. Yes, boss. Can you show that classification again, how it differs from the uh, other classification? Just show me the... Our, ours or... Uh, yours, uh, yours, yours. Yeah, so where... Uh, See, ours is a comprehensive kind of classification, wherein if you look at vote, I feel and we feel that it is a oversimplification of um, a very complex uh, anatomy. So what we, according to us, we feel that the nose contributes in its own way, the nasopharynx, the upper velum, the lower velum, the tongue base, and uh, all of these particular structures. And we will be also talking about interventional dice, everything. What is interventional dice? I'm going to talk in the subsequent slides. But using different tools to overcome different uh, levels of obstruction to prognosticate how a particular treatment plan, whether it is a a, a, a surgery or a device or a position will um, is going to be used to in the, ultimately in the outcome. We prob we basically bring in all these things into one particular reporting system, and uh, uh, we do this, but uh, and we report it. So long story short, we feel what is a oversimplification of a very complex anatomy. And every single level of obstruction has to be highlighted. And, um, and this is what we believe. And this is what we put forward for uh, publication, which uh, I think in due course of time will be published. So this is a, a comprehensive, we call it comprehensive drug-induced sleep endoscopy uh, uh, reporting system. Is, is that OK? OK, OK, perfect, perfect. Carry on, please. So, 
till the comprehensive system is used by everybody, it is still the word classification which is the easiest. So if you look at all the data, and if you say, which is the commonest site that contributes to upper airway obstruction, it is still the soft palate. 84% of the patients will uh, still have uh, soft palate obstruction. The next is tonsil, which is 32%. Tongue base, very surprisingly, will have 50% of obstruction still happens at the level of the tongue base. And last but not the least, 34% of patients have a staggering upper uh, epiglottic obstruction. Why is epiglottic obstruction so important? Epiglottic obstruction significantly reduces the success of PAP therapy, which is the gold standard therapy. So if you were to basically treat a patient's soft palate, it is still the so commonest level of obstruction. But will all patients have only soft palate? Not really, unfortunately. Most of the patients at the level of the soft palate will have an obstruction along with a combination of these particular uh, 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 structures lower down the upper airway. Now, if you just basically look at what percentage of patients will have a complete collapse? What percentage of patients will have incomplete collapse? That is, you're in your word classification, do you have a two more common or a one more common? There are two more commons than the one more common. 69% of the patients will have complete collapses at the level of the soft palate. Whereas in the hyperpharynx, which is actually a very loose term because hypopharynx is not single structure. Hypopharynx is lateral hypopharyngeal wall, tongue base, and epiglottis together. All three of these structures have about 56% contributing to a complete airway obstruction. So completes are more common than incompletes. So now, with this basic understanding, let's look at this particular, and, and I would now request all of you to pay attention. Okay, now let's look at this particular video. Now, is this a two or one? Earlier, I've seen shown you some earlier videos, right? Now I'm going to pause here so that you can all understand that this is a two. Now, remember the earlier videos I showed you? Earlier videos, there were vibrations and partial obstructions. But here you can see a complete obstruction. Now, is it a lateral collapse? Is it a circumferential collapse? Or is this an anteroposterior collapse? This is a lateral collapse. You can see the patient's effort, right? The patient is putting an effort. He's trying to breathe, but he's just not able to breathe. And this is a two, and it is a lateral collapse, right? It's a complete obstruction. Now we'll just observe this. And then slowly after this, we go in, we go in. Now, beyond the level of the velum, now we are now at the level of the oropharynx. Is the oropharynx, is oropharynx two or one? It is a one because it is not a complete obstruction. These two walls are not kissing each other. This is a partial obstruction. So this is a one. So at the level of the velum, in this particular video, it is a two lateral at the level of the velum. It is a one lateral at the level of the oropharynx. 
Now I'm going to let the video play. Please look at what is happening to the epiglottis. Is the tongue base collapsing? No. So is it a 2, 0, 2, 1 or 2, 2? It's a tongue base 0. This means T, 0. Because there is no tongue base obstruction. But what is happening to the epiglottis? The epiglottis is collapsing completely from side to side. Are you able to understand? Now, there is a complete collapse happening at the level of the epiglottis. So again, let me play this video from the beginning. Now, this is a complete collapse at the level of the velum. No airway is going in. You can see the effort. There is no airway going in. No airway going in. No airway going in. This is apnea. This is at the level of the velum. This is a two lateral. Now it's opened up. Now we are going down. We are going down. Once we cross the velum, we are going to the level of the oropharynx, which is a oropharynx is one because it's not completely collapsing. So it is V2 lateral, O1 lateral, T0, E2 lateral. Am I clear? Very, very clear. Okay. Now we'll go with the next video. Now, you can see again, this is lateral. Now you can see this is lateral. There is no complete obstruction. There is only vibration. This is lateral as well. And now, even the... Please watch this video. What is happening to the oropharynx? Completely collapsing. But pay attention to the interretinoid mucosa and the supraglottis. The entire airway is collapsing. This is a completely collapsible global collapse. The entire airway is just collapsing in random fashion in a circumferential way at times, in lateral way at times, in, in, in multiple directions. This is basically telling us that this is a condition where the patient's upper airway's ability to keep itself open is not very... So there, the... the, the uh, the inherent capacity of the upper airway to keep itself open is very, very low. Now let's look at this particular video. This is the nasopharynx. I'm standing at the top end of the patient. You can stand at the side of the patient also. Now slowly, without disturbing the patient, we are at the posterior coena. Now, let me just go through now. Right. Now,
Now look at this particular, how is this? You can see antro posteriorly, the palate is collapsing and side to side also, the palate is collapsing. And this palate is collapsing like this. It's almost coming into the uvula is so lax, it's falling off into the nasopharynx. There is with every breath, it is collapsing. This is apnea. And then there's a breakaway. This is at the this is a this is the time where the airway just gives up. Again, it is blocked. We are still at the level of the velum. We are not going. See, the patient is putting the effort. You can see the airway being pulled. It's completely blocked. So now I'm pushing my scope through, but still the whole airway is completely blocked. So I come out a little bit. We'd have to spend enough time to score because you can't just go in like that, tuck, 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 and come out. We have to spend time. Again, you can see. Now, how is this collapsing? Anteroposteriorly. See this? complete blockage, we should let this happen. During this time, the saturation would be going down. And then after a couple of efforts, it gives way. And then he breathes again. And then the airway starts collapsing again. And now you can look at how the I want you to pay attention now. Yeah. Look at the how the epiglottis is folding in. Just pay attention to it. It will come. Yes. Do you see that? See how the lateral pharyngeal walls are squeezing the... See how the epiglottis is going, is getting squeezed like an ice cream cone. This is distinctly different from the epiglottis I showed you earlier. That and this are collapsing in side to side way. But this is a secondary epiglottic collapse, whereas that is a primary epiglottic collapse. A primary epiglottic collapse has nothing causing the epiglottis to be closed in a side-to-side -side direction. But here, you can see that the lateral hypopharyngeal wall is so compliant that it is squeezing the epiglottis from side to side. So, with this understanding, let's go to the next level. What is interventional dice? Interventional dice, as the name suggests, that we do particular maneuvers or we do, we add in certain, do some particular structures 
or do some kind put in some particular things like putting a nasopharyngeal airway or shifting the patient to a particular stage just to see how they behave with that particular nasopharyngeal airway or positional let me just demonstrate now this is interventional dice what have i done i have put a nasopharyngeal airway to bypass the soft palate to see by just doing some kind of a soft tissue and an oropharyngeal procedure will it help this particular patient as you can see my nasopharyngeal airway has gone beyond the oropharynx it's gone beyond the velopharynx but has it helped this particular patient let us see if it helps this particular patient so this particular intervention will help to prognosticate whether a soft palate or an oropharyngeal procedure will help this particular patient see in spite of the airway being there the mucosa the redundant upper airway is just squeezing squeezing into the just see how the mucosa redundant upper airway and the redundant mucosa is collapsing into the nasopharyngeal airway what does this tell you this basically tells you that the upper airway is not going to respond to your soft palate procedure or oropharyngeal procedure if you were to do it as a stand alone procedure because trust me it's very easy to do a soft palate or a lateral uh, or an oropharyngeal procedure by doing this particular intervention you are able to prognosticate to your patient the success of your upper airway procedure and also prognosticate the patient whether how compliant his upper airway is whether a surgical intervention will help him or may not help him so this is how we use an uh, the nasopharyngeal airway to prognosticate the success of your surgical intervention now this is a interventional procedure called intraoral dice now what is this most of our patients are are, are mouth breathers as you would have seen you can see here orally i'm going because this patient is a mouth breather and this is the tongue this is the soft palate and you can see how the tongue is folding upon itself and causing a obstruction see how beautifully we are able to see on um, intra oral uh, passing the scope whether what will what will this trans oral uh, procedure tells you it basically tells you that the tongue is just falling off into the oropharynx because there is very less tone and there is no place for the soft the tongue to sit into the oral cavity that is why it has folded itself and just falling into the oral cavity so doing a palatal procedure in such patients will obviously not give you any kind of a successful outcome now positional therapy and this is a chapter that i have written in uh, uh, in in this textbook called drug in use sleep endoscopy and the importance of positional therapy 50% of sleep apneics may have positional uh, sleep apnea so while you can actually tilt the head and do a drug in use sleep endoscopy to uh, give some kind of a effect of position while you do drug induced sleep endoscopy so if you have a patient you can actually make the patient's head tilt towards the right or left and perform the same procedure and see the behavior of the upper airway now we've taken this to the next level what is advanced dice now advanced dice is you do a sleep endoscopy with propofol but look at this particular patient he's got a complete level 2 or uh, polysomnography strapped to the uh, particular patient 
This is the sleep study and this is the sleep endoscopy. Simultaneously, we're doing the, uh, the procedure so that we know exactly what is going on physiologically and what is going on anatomically. I'll let this video run so that you can uh, try to just get a, uh, this is the, um, and this is the level two. You can see the patient's effort there. This is me doing the, this is the nasal thermistor. This is the upper airway. And slowly I'll just show the, you can now see how the patient is having apnea. His, uh, his breathing has become abdominal. Uh, you can see the airway obstructing here at the level of the palate. And these are the leads showing flow limitation, oxygen desaturation. And this is advanced dice. So, and you can bring it all into a particular, uh, a single sort of uh, amalgamation to understand what is happening in the upper airway. But during the drug-induced sleep endoscopy, you have to stay in each of the level at particular time because the upper airway can change with time. And hence, you have to spend that particular time at each level to understand the behavior of the upper airway at each level. You can't just go in and come out and say that this is the pattern and this is what I will do. And this is. If there is any uh, uh, important slide that I want you to look at, it is this. Now, remember I was speaking to you about BIS and BIS and how important this is. Now, why is BIS so important? Because each of these numbers that your BIS talks to you, tells you, signifies a particular stage of non-REM sleep. So, if your BIS is anywhere between 81 and 76, you are scoring the behavior of the upper airway during N1 sleep. If your BIS is showing 75 to 63, that means you are scoring N2 sleep. And if your BIS is below 62, that means you are scoring N3 sleep. What you would be missing here is and immediately those of the, the, the smart guys amongst you would automatically look at, okay, I see N1, N2, N3 signifying, uh, signifying non-REM sleep. Where is the BIS for REM sleep? You would definitely wonder. Dear colleagues, drug-induced sleep endoscopy does not score REM sleep. If there is one of the biggest problems or flaws with drug-induced sleep endoscopy, it can only score non-REM sleep. It does not score REM sleep. Hence, this particular caveat needs to be understood. But nevertheless, do we, have, do we sleep most of our time in REM sleep? No. Like I said yesterday, most of us sleep in N2 sleep and hence, this drug-induced sleep endoscopy is pretty good to show uh, the behavior of the upper airway. There are certain controversies, obviously. What are the controversies? One, whether this is natural sleep or drug-induced sleep. And of course, I spoke to you about this in, in that particular slide that there is a lot of data to show 
that whether you do a sleep study in natural sleep or in drug induced sleep you probably will give get the same value in terms of ahi so that particular controversy can be laid to rest what about depth of sedation you don't want too deep you don't want too light and hence you use bispectral index scoring so that you understand you don't want to be overscoring your study hence using bis to uh, understand the depth of your sedation is very very important so that controversy is also cleared this particular video will show you the behavior of the upper airway at a bis of about 80 look at the upper airway it's partially blocked right it's partially blocked you can see that it's only giving you a partial obstruction. If you look at 70, look how the upper airway is completely collapsing at the base of 70. So monitoring your sleep study, your uh, dice based on this is very, very important. So the third con con controversy is observer variation because there is today I do it or Dr. Jankaram does it. All of us should be actually be able to talk in the same lines. So there is a lot of data that has put that uh, that has come in that there is a lot of uh, agreement between um, inter observers whether I do it or he does it or somebody X Y Z does it. All of us we talk about the same thing. So this is a study that qualifies that particular caveat, which is inter-observer variability. The fourth controversy is we don't have a universal grading system. Yes, that is a controversy, but I think in the near future, probably we will have a, a universal grading system. But what is the biggest question of them all? Does drug-induced sleep endoscopy affect surgical outcomes? Well, there is a lot of data out there that basically shows that uh, earlier we did not have that data, but now we know that drug-induced sleep endoscopy is associated with improved surgical outcomes. And this is a multicentric cohort study. But what are the factors in drug-induced sleep endoscopy that are associated with poor outcomes? One, a complete circumferential collapse at the level of the velum will have a poor surgical outcome. A lateral, a complete lateral velopharyngeal collapse also may be associated with poor outcome. A complete AP collapse at the level of the tongue base may be associated with poor outcome. And a supraglottic collapse may be associated with poor outcomes. So if you have these particular findings, you have to take it with a pinch of salt and discuss these findings with your patient, saying that, look, boss, these findings you have, your surgical outcomes may not be stellar, but I will try to fix all these particular problems in the, uh, with the different techniques that I know to improve the outcomes. So what is the impact of dice in patient selection? One, it helps pap therapy because you, you can do pap while, you, while you're doing pap, you'll be able to do a drug-induced sleep endoscopy. And I have videos and I will show you that. You can identify the different patterns of obstruction, severity of obstruction, and prognosticate your patients or do a particular procedure based on the finding. You can actually do, put an appliance to the particular patient and while you're doing, uh, or you can do a jaw thrust and see how the appliance works. You can twist the patient to one particular side and see how the airway changes. And if you have done a surgery or if you have done, have a patient of uh, PAP failure, you can even assess treatment failures. So, 
there is going to be a, a, a huge uh, influx more and more into our practice. Uh, like this beautiful paper from Singapore says that DICE has, DICE has the potential to be the main driver behind the next level of care for our OSA patients. The advantages are, yes, it's going to be a, a, a dynamic, uh, it is a dynamic assessment of sleep. It's not a, a static assessment of sleep. You are directly visualizing the uh, obstructions at the level of uh, the different levels. You are able to differentiate an obstruction from a vibration, as I've shown you. You are able to establish different patterns of obstruction. This is, there is very good test, retest reliability. The epiglottis cannot be picked up in any other form of uh, uh, evaluation. Eschmark, which is a jaw thrust maneuver, can be done, and you can look at the behavior of the upper airway. It can be done along with PAP therapy, and along with this, you will be able to get good results as well. Yes, it is time-consuming. Yes, over-sedation can give rise to problems at times, and you need to select the drugs which do not reduce the respiratory drive. Complications can happen. The, there can be oxygen desaturation, and hence you cannot do this procedure anywhere and everywhere. Salivary aspiration can happen, hence giving glycopyrrolate half an hour before the procedure can avoid that particular problem. There can be laryngospasm, which, which you will have to be aware of, and hence it is better done under the supervision of the anesthetist. So, in conclusion, DICE is a valid addition to polysomnography. It is not an alternative to polysomnography. The anatomical structures that are involved in the sound generation and obstruction of the upper airway can be identified individually. And various studies have examined the association between drug-induced sleep endoscopy and outcomes of palatal surgery and mandibular repositioning appliances to improve our outcomes. So we can very confidently say now that drug-induced sleep endoscopy is a gold standard in optimizing obstructive sleep apnea patient selection for non-PAP treatment modalities. Thank you. I would like to st uh, stop this particular lecture at this point. If there are any questions uh, I'd like to take, yeah, so uh, Mike, uh, let me check if there are questions. I have a few questions. Sure. So, uh, while examining the oral cavity. Yes. Um, are there any features, apart from the grading system, which uh, denote an obstruction uh, at the level of the velum or the tongue or epiglottis? That is the Friedman staging. We can actually... Yeah, that's, that's fine. Friedman staging is fine. Uh, have you noticed any other thing which will uh, you know, tell you that maybe there's an obstruction towards this? Uh, just just sitting in yeah. front of the patient and opening yes. the mouth of the patient? Yes. Yeah, there are. Uh, uh, but these are all awake evaluation and static evaluation techniques. So the moment you look at the facial, fa patient's facial structure, like how I spoke yesterday, yeah, yeah, yeah. to make out. But unless you go behind the palate where the obstruction happens, behind the tongue base where the obstruction happens, sitting in front of the patient, we may not be able to... Uh, uh, okay, uh, let me tell you some, something which, <laughs> out of experience, of course, sure, I didn't sure, publish, sure. All, publish all this. I just want to tell you... Uh, see, uh, in allergic rhinitis, we have what yes. is called the uh, salute, allergic yes. salute. Yes, yes. Same way, when you look at the eula, there will always be a crease. Yes. Uh, I'm it, not sure if uh, you, you... It's go, called uh, mucosal you know? telescoping. Yeah, I mean, that is, I mean, I call it the eula crease sign. Something yeah. like, uh, you know, the uh, allergic salute. Yes. And I consistently see that these, if you say, ah, oh, and the eula, you have two or three creases... That definitely correlates. And I first I ask the patient, do you snore? Yes, absolutely. Yes. So 
I mean, has it been published? I just want to know. Whether there's no, a, it has okay. not been published. We can we can publish it. I think we can. Ular do it. Sign, that is one. Second is I wanted to ask you. Um, in mouth breathing, what happens is there is a little uh, amount of discoloration of the tongue, and yes. uh, I mean, is it is it really correlating with? Uh, yes. Um, you know. Yes. It Have you does. seen that or I'm just yes. imagining? No, no, no. We classically see that. And another very typical sign we see is uh, teeth marks on the tongue. We yes. call it tongue yeah, scalloping. Yeah. 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 Has this, it been published? Uh, it has been, it has not been published as a, as a pathognomonic sign, but it has been uh, described in all signs. the textbooks. Oh, oh. Okay, uh, now let me come to the main uh, questions. Patients, uh, for example, even today I saw a patient, uh, tall, six feet, four inches tall, uh, young boy, around uh, 23 years old. Uh, 26 years old, I'm sorry. She got married recently. And uh, we, uh, he came with, his wife told that after marriage he had snoring. And... Um, when we did the level two study, I showed a AHI of 55. Okay. Uh, 55 and hypopnea was uh, more, mm. but he was not. Uh, I did a lateral cephalometry. Right. Uh, looked uh, quite within normal limits and uh, patient little bit uh, had a small tummy. Apart from that, he was, I mean, not very obese. Now, uh, when I examined him, he had a little enlarged turbinate, and then uh, his uh, I didn't find a crease sign. I I go by that, you know, the Eula yeah, crease. Yeah, sign. Absolutely. So, I'm so so obsessed by it. I just examined him, uh, not at Dana Dice. I'm asking you some questions. Sure. Number one, how common is sleep apnea? And uh, when I examined his Friedman, uh, all that was very normal. Uh, I mean, uh, we could see everything, and uh, the tongue base was not big. But his wife was telling that he was snoring very loudly and his AHI was 50. He was going on asking me, Doc, what do I do? Do I have to operate, go under the knife? And uh, I'm not willing for a CPAP and things like that. So how do you treat such patients? I'm sure you would get so many yes. patients like this. Yes. So one, that this particular patient obesity is out. Like uh, the treatment philosophy we have to bring in. One, we know that this is a patient who is not obese, number one. So he's, he's again in the race. Number two, we know that he's not a skeletal patient because morphologically you looked at him and you found that there are no skeletal abnormalities. Then automatically you have to look at what all can be static and dynamic obstructions in this particular patient. Is there anything in terms of... Inferior a, terminate hypertrophy was there. That is the only thing it. I could find so out. Inferior, the inferior terminate, terminate hypertrophy hy was there. The inferior terminate hypertrophy is causing him to mouth breathe. So the moment the patient is mouth breathing, two currents of air is going through the nose and through the mouth, and the palate is fluttering between two currents of air because he's a mouth breather and his snoring is awful. So... One, not only we need to establish the nasal airway, try to clear off all the static obstructions before we put forward any kind of... See, one philosophy is single-stage multi-level or the other philosophy is you can clear off all the static obstructions, see if he improves, and then go ahead treating the dynamic obstructions. So my question to you was this. Just one uh, pathology, like for example, inferior turbinate hypertrophy alone. Mm. Can it cause a AHI of 50? This is no. what I'm asking you. No. This is what I'm asking you. No. It is definitely not going to cause an AHI of 55, but AHI alone is not directly proportionate to anatomy. For example, let's say your patient has adenoid. Let us say grade 4 adenoids, huge tonsils, he will have an AHI of 95. But 
just a turbinate hypertrophy with the rest of the airway being absolutely normal, it is unlikely to have an AH of 55. Ah. But the ah. caveat again, you have said, ah. is, is hypopneas are more. Ah, hypopneas are more. A lot of data that shows that hypopnea is driven by nose. Okay. Ah. A static Obstruction like an adenoid or a tonsil or a lingual tonsil can never cause hypopnea. It will always cause apnea. It will always cause the bigger boss. It will not cause the hypopnea. So if there is high hypopnea, the AHI is driven by hypopnea, the nose may be a cause. Similarly, a patient has positional sleep apnea, the nose also has to be ruled out. Good. So this is my first point. Second point I want to ask you. Very, very nice answer. Uh, second point, see, when I used, uh, I have been doing snoring for a long time. Of course, yeah. I have never talked about it. Uh, when I used to do a sleep study, I don't know where I saw it. Uh, I got trained a uh, long time in Iowa. And then I came also to Dr. Uh, Ashok Pillai. Uh, Apollo uh, were doing a multi-level you know, yes, suprahyoid, yes. tongue base. I've seen a yes, lot yes, of such yes. stuff. Yes. So I, if you've seen them, yeah, I, I got trained by them for 10 days and then went back and started doing all that. Now, the thing is, in sleep study, you are telling, you know, in dice, you put an nasopharyngeal airway. Correct. Is it validated? Because I didn't see that in your talk anywhere. No. So, so, so this interventional dice wherein mm. we put in the nasopharyngeal airway and trying to see if, does it change the treatment uh, outcome in terms of AHI? Unfortunately, we can't do that like any surgery, right? You can't do a, uh, uh, a randomized control trial taking your patient, say, I put the nasopharyngeal airway and uh, I didn't get a response or I will, but... For you in clinical practice, because we owe it to our patients, this simple technique of putting nasopharyngeal airway, bypassing the palate and oropharynx can tell you whether the tongue base is getting cleared or no. That's all. Excellent. Uh, let me see the chat box if anybody has got questions. Just a minute, sir. Yeah, sure. Meanwhile, I will uh, get the... Uh, Uh, there are no questions. Uh, you can go on to the next uh, part of your lecture. Yes, I will just... Uh... Can you see my slides? No. No? No, no. Okay. You're not shared your screen, sir. Yeah, I am. I am. I am sharing the screen now. Yeah. Is it seen? Perfect. Perfect. Yes. So now that we sort of, there is a lot more that I wanted to show in, uh, in drug-induced sleep endoscopy because now we almost do titrations also with drug-induced sleep endoscopy. But um, if time permits, I think probably in the subsequent uh, talks, because I thought at least we should be able to bring in there the- There is no time permitting, sir. It's all your time. There no, 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 I know, but I wanted to talk, finish uh, today's uh, talks also. So what okay. I will do is dice titration and how we do CPAP titration with dice. Uh, I will probably show in the um, in the subsequent uh, days to come. Now, so the outline of the talk is uh, it is improving outcomes, right? So it is involving. I'm, I'm going to talk both about PAP therapy and also talk about um, uh, multi-level surgery. So the outline of my talk is going to be, one, how do I improve PAP therapy? 
to how what is the role of dice in decision making to improve outcomes the very new concept of transverse maxillary deficiency or what we now call as loss of coupling and its management and very briefly i'm going to talk about phenotypification of palate and tongue base based on dice and how we have the management based on that so again i bring this particular slide which is the uh, with the american academy of sleep medicine guideline wherein pap therapy is the gold standard and we know that gold standard has multiple problems and we i keep bringing this apple study again and again to tell us that the success rate is only 40% and we know that we should be seriously reconsidering the first line of uh, treatment for obstructive sleep apnea and multiple factors affect the adherence of cpap therapy what are the factors one is subjective sleep related symptoms that means the moment i put the cpap how that particular individual is feeling about it that determines adherence two how bad the sleep apnea is that determines adherence and three the knowledge of cpap's effect that means one's own understanding of how bad it is affects the adherence so if you really look at literature the most important point that one needs to understand and this is a very important take home point is adherence to pap therapy in the first one month determines whether the patient is going to accept pap therapy or no so please remember so if you want to give pap therapy and you want the patient to use pap therapy how comfortable that patient is during that first one month determines if the patient is going to continue using the pap therapy now what is the take home message from this it is upon us as sleep doctors as sleep physicians as sleep surgeons that we make sure that the the gold standard therapy is accepted and what is one of the most important factor that determines whether the patient is going to be adherent to a pap therapy in the first one month nos 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 so there are lots of structures for example like this particular lateral uh, collapse of the uh, epiglottis or a narrow structure at the upper airway again determines whether the patient is going to adhere to the cpap therapy now if the patient is not going to is going to have an obstruction like this will he adhere to the sleep apnea therapy what is the point in giving cpap to this particular patient there is no point and hence doing a drug induced sleep endoscopy before you even want to give a cpap to this particular patient is very important and although the nasal cavity may represent a narrow inlet for the airway this is the preferred way to breathe and there are lots of studies that showed that patients with a, a airway obstruction uh, if you take all the patients who get sleep studies done 65% of the patients will have nasal obstruction 65% of patients with obstructive sleep apnea will have nasal obstruction as their significant symptom and cpap pressure treatment with nasal pillows is the best way of delivering this particular uh, pap therapy but if you have a nasal obstruction will nasal pillow work it won't work because if there is significant airway obstruction the the nose cannot be a conduit of air going inside so it is upon us as ent surgeons to make the gold standard therapy even adherent to the patient because adherence in the first one month will determine whether the cpap therapy 
will be used by this particular patient in the rest of his life or he will just abandon it. And if you look at literature again, influencing factors for CPAP adherence are anatomical uh, are based on anatomical structures of the upper airway. And what are they? What are these anatomical structures? Septal deviations, turbinate hypertrophies, tonsil hypertrophy, and palate, and in that order. And it has been shown that the bigger the deviation, the, the worse the deviation, the poorer the CPAP adherence. If the patient has gross turbinate hypertrophy, the poor CPAP adherence. So you, as a treating physician, not evaluating a gross septal deviation, not evaluating a turbinate hypertrophy, is, is making the person not use a gold standard therapy. I just hope I'm trying to make the point across properly. Am I clear? Am I clear? Very clear, sir. Yeah. So it is upon us as treating doctors to make sure that there are no static obstructions that can jeopardize the treatment with CPAP. So all the factors, like I've, I've shown a lateral collapse earlier. Look at this kind of epiglottic collapse. This is... This is an AP collapse. I've shown you a lateral collapse earlier. This is an anteroposterior collapse at the level of the epiglottis. If you have a patient with this kind of epiglottic collapse and you give a CPAP, will he use the CPAP? He will not use the CPAP. Then what is the point in even giving a CPAP? If you have a gross septal deviation and you give him nasal pillows just because that is the best adapted ma, uh, interface. Will he use it? He won't use it. So as ENT surgeons, we need to look at septal deviations, turbinate hypertrophies, adenoids, high arch palates, tonsil, palate position, lingual tonsils, and epiglottis. These are the most important points that you need to look at even if you want to sub prescribe CPAP for your patient, when if, if you are scoring positive in any of these particular points, there is no point in giving a CPAP because your CPAP treatment will fail. And if you look at this beautiful paper again from Italy, 70% of OSA patients have nasal obstruction. And it is interesting to note that only 30% of patients have isolated anatomical abnormalities. 6% of patients have CRS. 26% have actually non-allergic rhinitis. What, we, what would we expect? We would, ex we would think that patient would have allergic rhinitis, but it is non-allergic rhinitis that uh, rules the roost in terms of nasal pathologies which uh, contribute to uh, uh, obstructive sleep apnea. And 95.4% of the patients with nasal inflammatory conditions such as AR and non-allergic rhinitis suffered from nocturnal respiratory obstruction. So again and again and again, I keep coming back to the fact that how important the nose is, how what an important role the nose plays in giving adequate outcomes to our particular patients. And then this beautiful paper from Stanford, the percentage of patients regularly using CPAP before nasal surgery, if it was 38.7%, the moment you do a, a nasal procedure, the CPAP adherence just shifted from 40% to 90%. So all these patients all you have to do, you don't have to do a great procedure. Just identify the static obstructions in the nose, clear out those, give them simple CPAP, they will be very happy patients. So this is a paper that we published actually. Uh, this was a multi-centric study of 735 patients wherein we 
we answered the simple question does nasal surgery improve multi level surgery outcomes as well because i was speaking to you so far only about uh, cpap does it improve multi level surgeries yes it does improve multi level surgeries as well now a simple simple no score this is something that most rhinologists use uh, to show whether a simple septoplasty helps or no this particular no score can help you to uh, to guide whether which is whether a nasal mask or an oro nasal mask is what is required to give your particular patient so this is a simple five point questionnaire that you can ask and the number that you get from this particular thing right you can multiply it by 5 and if you get a number which is more than 50 that tells you that this patient has significant nasal obstruction and giving a patient a nasal mask is of no value if the no score is less than 50 then you can use a nasal mask and this patient will adhere to this particular treatment so by using this particular simple uh, no score a uh, parameter which rhinologists use you can select a very good uh, uh, nasal mask or uh, nasal mask or oro nasal mask for your particular patient so the algorithm to use when you want to give cpap for your patient is one evaluate the nasal cavity and oropharynx you have a gross septal deviation you have gross inferior turbinate hypertrophy you have patients for uh, on medications for uh, uh, hypertrophic rhinitis consider nasal surgery if you have gross turbinate uh, tonsil hypertrophy consider uh, tonsillectomy if you have a very high palate position like friedman position combine the procedure uh, combine an oral appliance and then give a cpap if you give follow this particular algorithm cpap therapy will be more effective in your patients that is how you improve outcomes of your cpap therapy if you are somebody who is in the periphery who don't want to you do multi level surgeries if you want to give cpap make sure that that cpap works evaluate this patient make sure all the static obstructions are cleared and give a cpap you have a happy patient without evaluating if you give a cpap just because you can prescribe a cpap you have a failed patient you have a failed therapy please remember that now this is a very very interesting uh, article which has come and this is a, and i'm sure uh uh dr janki will be eager to ask this question so before he asks i thought i will only answer what is adherence what should be people be aiming for what do you mean by adherence right so by definition right optimal adherence is the average usage level at which there is normalization of symptoms with cpap so it has been shown that for self reported sleeping to get better right if you use cpap for 4 hours it's enough right if if the patient wants to feel happy if you give cpap for 4 hours that's enough he'll feel happy if you want to use an objective sleepiness score like epworth sleepiness score if you give cpap for 6 hours per night that is when your epworth sleepiness score will improve and functional status supposing you want to do some kind of an objective uh, uh, an objective test like multiple sleep latency test to identify whether this patient's uh, uh, symptom is, in terms of sleepiness is improving or no the patient has to use the cpap for 7.5 hours per night am i clear 
no yeah. have i caused confusion very clear yeah perfect so in terms what is the next most important thing one is daytime symptoms this is one of the most commonest symptoms with which patients come to us so the patient comes to us with doc will my daytime symptoms get better if my daytime symptoms have to get better how long should i use the cpap so we have answered that particular question the next question you will ask is doctor my bp is not coming under control or my cardiovascular risk for arrhythmia is not coming under control so it has to be understood that a a a one hour improvement in cpap adherence right supposing you are adherent you are adhering to your cpap for more for more than one hour is associated with a reduction of bp by 1.4 mm of mercury so the longer you use the cpap the longer duration you use the cpap the better bp control you will get am i clear and there is that evidence that uh, uh, there is some evidence to show the sleepier patients may experience greater reduction in bp resulting from cpap as opposed to non cdp patient so what about dose response relationship now the biggest question is whether using 100% cpap for 4 hours and throwing the cpap away is better or putting the cpap for 8 hours and sleeping is that better nobody knows that particular question and nobody knows what is the role of cpap in mild osa so all of these questions are huge questions that we need to answer especially when you talk about pap therapy so the earlier i spoke about the duration and how using cpap improves cardiovascular risk and in the this slide i spoke about all the big question marks when compared to gold standard therapies so don't think that cpap is the ultimate uh, treatment in terms of uh, uh, osa management there are lots of questions that are unanswered when it comes to cpap what about multi level surgery we all love to do multi level surgery right so what are the strategies to improve multi level surgery like i said evaluation is pivotal for successful treatment and like i said sleep study helps to tell you whether the patient has to go into hdu in the post operative period or he can be sent into a ward the the higher the hi the uh, the bigger the complication in the immediate post operative period for example if you have a patient with 80 ahi it is better you send the patient after surgery to icu if a patient has 30 ahi 20 ahi you can send the patient directly to the ward but this is not a dictum but this is something that you can go uh, with uh, a decent understanding that a patient with 30 ahi without any comorbidities uh, he will not throw a surprise at you like accelerated hypertension or he will not come out with some kind of a surprise at you now this is again something that is very important in surgical planning and then we spoke about it uh, there is this reputation that we need to always understand to improve uh, outcomes in multi level surgery the global versus local philosophy the soft tissue versus bony philosophy and the obstruction versus collapse philosophy wherein you need to know obstruction which is caused by a static obstruction whereas collapse is a is a dynamic obstruction so obstruction is always there whether it is is whether it is patient when the patient is awake or when the patient is uh, asleep whereas a collapse will only come when the patient is asleep 
And we know drug-induced sleep endoscopy changes our treatment choices from 40 to 70%. And this is the word classification that we know. And the uh, we know based on all this literature that it does improve uh, treatment outcomes. So what is our approach to improve multi-level surgery? Now, once the patient comes to you, and once you do your questionnaire, once you do the flexible laryngopharyngoscopy, it is important to do a dental consult as well. Why is that important? Because 60% of patients will have malocclusions. And even if you do a beautiful surgery in the airway behind, if the patient can't close the mouth because the patient has an overjet or an overbite, and that is called as an open lip seal, no matter what you do, his mouth will be open and he will be breathing through the mouth and his snoring will never go away. Also important to do a CT scan of the paranasal sinuses and a CBCT to measure the volume of the upper airway. And it is very important to do a P polysomnography. And in this order, or this is the order, your first consult should be. Once the flexible laryngopharyngoscopy identifies the static obstructions, you do the drug-induced sleep endoscopy to identify the, sloth, the, uh, the soft tissue problems, identify the obstructions, differentiate them from the collapses, identify the skeletal problems, identify the soft tissue collapses with the, uh, with the uh, skeletal collapses and come out with a treatment plan. Now at this juncture, I would like to bring to you this particular concept called loss of coupling. What is loss of coupling? Loss of coupling, dear colleagues, is maxillary constriction. It's one of the most important factors determining nasal airway properties. It contributes to lateral narrowing of the upper oral cavity because like I spoke to you yesterday, what is the roof of the mouth? The roof of the mouth is the floor of the nose. If there is good space here for the tongue to sit, the tongue will sit in the oral cavity with a negative pressure cupping the, uh, the, uh, the tongue with the heart palate. If there is no space for the tongue to sit here, the tongue will automatically fall back and cause retroglossal obstruction. So identifying these patients some uh, and treating these patients is very, very, very important. So let's see how this is important. Let's look at the sleep endoscopy of this particular patient. Now we are going through the nose. Now we have gone through the nose. We are at the level of the palate. You can see that there is a complete obstruction. This is a lateral obstruction. And you can see in the oropharynx now, how laterally this is coming and causing a collapse. And you can see this is complete apnea now. Now, what we don't realize is that this patient is also a, this I just wanted to demonstrate apnea how the patient is pulling in and you can see the complete collapse happening. And then there is a vibration again and the rest of the upper airway is completely open. Now, now we are going transorally and look at the tongue. This tongue is completely collapsing. 
Now, if you do any kind of a procedure just at the level of the palate, thinking that that is a, a, a palatal level of obstruction, we would be in foot in mouth. See how the palate is just collapsing and it's folding on side to side and it is causing. So there is complete. So if we miss this finding, then if and if we were to do just a nasal dice, and then if we would just do a palatal surgery, we would be in trouble. This is another example of a particular mouth breathing patient. Again, see how the tongue base is collapsing. And and you can see how the tongue is completely collapsing. Now look at this particular patient. So the tongue is falling back and then it is causing significant obstruction. And this is And you can slowly see how the tongue is coming back and it's going to cause an obstruction like that. So it is important that you identify these mouth breathers and do an intraoral dice in these patients. So when you look at a patient and you see that there is a narrow maxilla contributing to increased nasal resistance, there is a tongue displacement. We need to do a procedure called distraction osteogenesis maxillary expansion. And I will talk to you shortly about what this is. If there is no narrow maxilla, and if you think that there is increased nasal resistance, doing a good nasal procedure will be good enough. But if you have a clear-cut craniofacial case, or you have a case of failed soft tissue procedure, you can directly go for maxillomandibular advancement. Now, what is dome? Now, remember I showed you that there is a transverse obstruction at the level of the uh, maxilla. So here, what we do is we do a leafoot one osteotomy, as you can see that we are doing here. And we do a mid-sagittal split. Here you can see the leafoot one and we're doing a sagittal split. And we and the patient has a, 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 a mini screw system and slowly because we keep increasing it by 0.25 millimeters every day till we completely expand the jaw like this. And then we do orthodontic treatment. And just with that, you can look at how beautifully the AHA is coming from 77 to 12, just doing this particular procedure. That is how important the maxilla and assessing the maxilla and trying to do the right procedure is. Now, sometimes you can get away doing a good piriform plasty. So this is a paper that is being published and uh, 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 you don't have to do one of the, any of those big, big surgeries. You can actually drill this particular piriform aperture and this also has been associated with improving outcomes. Now that we have moved out from improving 
the nose and uh, how we improve the uh, the decrease the nasal resistance to improve our outcomes in multi level surgery how do we actually plan the decision making in palate if you have an anterior posterior collapse you do a procedure called anterior palatoplasty this is a very very simple no brainer procedure if you have an anterior palate you want this to expand anterior posteriorly so once you do an anterior posterior let me just yeah if you have a collapse like this sorry if you have a collapse like this you do a procedure called anterior palatoplasty what is anterior palatoplasty it is a procedure wherein you create a box of about 2 into 1 cm you can use radio frequency you can use cublation you can do any one of these procedures just to create a raw area and once you create this raw area make these para uvula trenches and once you do the para uvula trenches you can use vicryl you can use pds and at the end of the procedure you want to create a scar vector which is antero posterior thereby you are pulling the palate antero posteriorly up and it has been shown that in 17 year meta analysis of palatal procedures the surgical procedure that achieved the best ahr reduction is antero palatoplasty that's a simple procedure but has one of the best efficacies when you have a lateral collapse like this when you have a lateral collapse like this you can do a procedure called expansion sphincter pharyngoplasty what is expansion sphincter pharyngoplasty once you do a once you do a a, a tonsillectomy you will be able to identify the vertically running fibers of the palato pharyngeus muscle in the tonsillar bed then you make a short incision parallel to the vertically running fibers of the palato pharyngeus and just keep a little bit of a margin so that you don't button out through the mucosa of the of the uh, uh, posterior pillar and similarly you make a incision uh, just lateral to it um at the junction between the vertically running fibers of the palato pharyngeus and the oblique fibers of the superior constrictor muscle you will be able to make that difference out so you make this particular incision and once you do that you have to make a uh, uh, nice uh, at the junction between the upper two third and lower two third you you cut the palato pharyngeus muscle and then put a tendon stitch and once you put a tendon stitch and a clump all those muscle fibers together now identify the pterygoid hamilus now why i'm running through this very slowly is a lot of the subsequent procedures that i'm going to talk to you about is based on this particular procedure 
the expansion sphincter pharyngoplasty or the functional expansion sphincter pharyngoplasty. This is the forerunner for all the procedures that have subsequently come. So now that we've uh, sutured this and made a tendon stitch, now you take a suture, identify the, uh, or make a small submucosal tunnel at the level of the pterygoid hamulus. Now all of us can palpate our pterygoid hamulus. Just come medial and posterior to your third molar, you will be able to palpate your pterygoid hamulus. Now, once you make an incision in that area, use a curved artery, go submucosally, and end up at the superior pole of the tonsil. Now, you made the small tunnel there. Now, once you make that tunnel there, you feed that suture with, uh, uh, into that particular like this, and then you can start tying up. And, and this is how you make sutures. And you can how, see how beautifully this particular lateral port opens up. In fact, even um, when you do your uh, uh, CPAP titration with dice, you will also see that CPAP also actually opens up this part only. So it is very important that you open up this particular part and you get this particular box-shaped uh, uh, sort of a thing at the end of the procedure. And you get pretty good, decent outcomes with a success rate of 82.60%. Expansion sphincter pharyngoplasty has pretty good success rates. What if you have a circumferential collapse like this? If you have a circumferential collapse, we do a procedure called modified Sam Robinson's procedure, wherein you create two triangular flaps with, based on the pterygomandibular raphe and open up this particular lateral pharyngeal port. And once you open this lateral pharyngeal port, you make the same kind of incision that we made for uh, expansion sphincter pharyngoplasty, cut the palatopharyngeus muscle between the upper two thirds and the lower one third. Once we do that, you cut the medially arching fibers of the palatoglossus muscle. You can see how we cut this. And then now this whole thing is exposed. Now take this medially arching fibers of the palatoglossus muscle and then a uh, palatopharyngeus muscle and suture it to the pterygoid hamulus. And in the subsequent procedures, you will see how this particular procedure has become so less minimally invasive and how this particular step is very important. So now slowly you will, now you're taking this suture and suturing these fibers with the posterior pillar fibers. And at the end of the procedure, you would get a a beautiful box like this. And remember that these are all uvula sparing procedures. We are all uvula lovers. You would be also um, concerned that the uvula is looking up. It's looking a, uh, a little raised, but what goes up has to come down. So it will eventually come down, but these are all uvula sparing procedures. So we found out that for anterior posterior collapse, we do anterior palatoplasty. For lateral collapse, you do an expansion sphincter or a functional expansion pharyngoplasty. For a circumferential collapse, you do modified sound Robinson's procedure.
And the most pro important procedure or the procedure now with, that we have slowly moved down to, which is the new kid on the block, and I'm sure all of you have tried this, it is the barb repositioning pharyngoplasty. Once this particular procedure has come, most of us have become minimally invasive. This procedure is faster. This procedure is less painful. This procedure is associated with poor and better outcomes. And, uh, and I know uh, uh, Dr. Janki has also done this particular procedure. If I'm not mistaken, correct, boss? In one of the OSA con Congress, Vikas Agarwal told, and uh, he... I was the first in India to do this Bob Suture. Yes, I, got I know that. Bob Suture's from Dubai. I saw that. Vinci, what is his name? Uh, Quill. Uh, he was uh, the one who propagated a long time back. This yes. was a long time. And yes. then I got 100 yes. of them. And yes. I tried it in around 10 patients. Yes. Out of which maybe my case selection was not good. So four patients failed. After right. that, still I have the Bob lying in my house. <laughs> so I think it's high time you start redoing it. Because yeah, the, the verdict is there. It is a fantastic procedure. The whole, uh, I mean, after we moved from those procedures, it's quicker, easier to do, better outcomes. So um, these are uh, good, good kind of uh, procedures that are out there. Uh, and I know, and I would uh, definitely, you are the first one to do it. And I think you have also posted it in social media, if I'm not mistaken. The, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yesterday... I just uh, want to know one question. Can I interrupt? Uh, please, please. Why is it that you have not talked about dynamic MRI at all? I have to talk to you about dynamic MRI. This is a, a, a procedure that uh, yesterday I sort of skipped this. So, oh. but dynamic MRI is a very important tool in pediatric age group yeah. and uh, especially in syndromic kids. So, mm. I thought I would bring it up then. Oh, the last. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, because okay. especially in Down's children, especially ah. where, uh, wherein you need to look at skeletal component and soft yeah. tissue component at the same spot. So that okay. is where dynamic MRI scores a lot. Okay. Um, and this is, uh, okay, let's. And yesterday, uh, Dr. Shilpi was asking about how come nobody is talking about weight? I think. One single factor that can actually weigh your success or uh, make your success uh, uh, fail is weight. There is a lot of data that is, uh, that's out there that shows that just by reducing weight was your airway can change from 11.6 square centimeters to 16.7 square centimeters. That is provided you clear off all the static obstructions. That is something that I want to very clearly make out. See, if there is some kind of a static obstruction sitting inside this lumen, just opening up the airway by losing weight will not change the outcome of the patient. That is very important. And I again feel like to bring this particular fact that just doing, just because you're a surgeon, you don't do uh, surgery for all. Just because you are a physician, you don't give CPAP for all. You are, as, a, as an ENT surgeon, very beautifully poised to give any kind of a treatment modality that is best suited for your particular patient. And personalization is the mantra. So... To improve outcomes in OSA patients, weight loss is mandatory. You have to read and understand your sleep reports. Please perform dice and all your patients. Identify all the obstructions. Communicate with your patient in detail your plan and your expected outcome, bringing all these things under one platform. 
And the most important thing that you need to understand is do not operate patients with unrealistic expectation. If a patient is asking unrealistic expectations, for example, will all my, uh, like saying, will my blood pressure become absolutely normal? That's just an erratic thing. You are not sure of that. Number one, if the patient is saying, Doc, do you think I will my sleep uh, quality will improve? Yes, it will improve to a certain extent. Will it have a 100% outcome? Maybe not. So you will have to say that, boss, your expectations are unrealistic. I probably may not be the right uh, uh, physician for you. Or you can try your level best to make the patient understand. But if the patient is having unrealistic expectation, and this is true for any kind of an uh, ENT uh, procedure, just not uh, sleep apnea surgeries. So do not operate these particular patients. That's it on this particular topic, boss. Excellent, excellent. Wonderful uh, talk, sir. Extraordinary as usual. I and want to actually is... show uh, how we titrate uh, uh, CPAP with, uh, um, with uh, uh, drug-induced sleep endoscopy. And I think we will do that uh, uh, when we come back next week. Uh, I will run that beautiful video um, because... The most important thing right now is it is now almost standard that whether you do a titration study and uh, identify the adequate CPAP pressure or you do a drug-induced sleep endoscopy and look at the pharyngeal opening pressure, the, uh, the pressure setting is the same. You would be surprised. So just doing sleep endoscopy without uh, a titration study is good enough to uh, prescribe a CPAP. And this goes out to all the Novice ENT surgeons uh, out there uh, that who want to give CPAP as the first line of treatment, which should be the right way forward also. Please do not underestimate the, the, the potential of DICE. DICE is a fantastic endoscopy and uh, it can give you lots of information. So uh, I think it's a fantastic lecture. I have a few uh, questions. Please. Number one, uh, are we going to talk about uh, surgical aspects later or? Uh... Yes. Okay. Then yes. I reserve my questions for that because I want to know about the uh, submental yes. part of fat. Then yeah. the digastric tendon transfer and all this stuff. Okay, next next time maybe. So uh, no, this was just a idea for people to understand know, that these are all Both there. Ideas. Overview. Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, just want to know something. See, uh, you have been into various congresses in sleep apnea. Of course, I am not because I am in a different field. Uh, what about the uh, physicians, the uh, pulmonologists? Uh, is there a little uh, resistance uh, for them to accept surgery? What is your take? It is there before, but now I think all of us are coming to the same kind of a platform. That That's why I keep bringing that slide again. You can't have a treatment where I will only give CPAP or I can't have a platform where you can say, I will only do surgery. No. We need to customize the treatment to each person. And that is where the pulmonologists are also now slowly coming up. We have lots of patients where they, like I keep showing that video where there is a huge blob sitting in the laryngeal inlet and the patient has been given a BiPAP. Right? And this BiPAP pressure is going to 25 centimeters. The patient is frail with a BMI of 23 using a CPAP with a 25 pressure. The patient's the pressure is so high that the machine, the mask is coming out of the face and they tie up the mask so much that the mask is not coming out. All because nobody put a scope inside and saw that there was a mask sitting on the supra. This kind of blunders were being done before. 
and lot of us as ENTs were not looking at maxillary constrictions. We were operating behind, oblivious to the fact that there is no place for the tongue to sit. If you cut off a part of the tongue and not create a space for it to sit in the oral cavity, what is the point in doing a transoral robotic surgery? So we've also had done a lot of mistakes. They also did a lot of mistakes. Dental guys are coming in very strong into this field with a lot of uh, with the dental sleep physiology, dental thing is coming up. So that is why in the in the in the uh, IASSA conference that I'm going to do this time in July, uh, I'm bringing everybody into the same platform. All the keynote lectures and orations will be common for ENTs, pulmonology, and dental, so that we all speak the same language and we all uh, can do the same thing. Uh, we as ENTs can do a little more than what an physician can do. We can evaluate the upper airway so beautifully and give the right modality. What stops you from giving a CPAP? What stops you from giving a mandibular advancing device? What stops you from doing surgery? You as an ENT surgeon is sitting on top of this chain of managing obstructive sleep apnea. But we need to remember one thing. If you have a patient with obesity hyperventilation syndrome, if you are having a patient with complex sleep apnea, with central F events, well, this when you bring in your, your, your pulmonology brother into the platform and say, boss, you have to come in and we are going to do this together. So that's how we have to proceed. Excellent, excellent. So I just want to have a small announcement. We were supposed to do the talks, uh, subsequent talks tomorrow and day after. Uh, but since, uh, you know, there's a little shortcoming there, I requested uh, Professor Srinivas Kishore to give the lecture on Monday and Tuesday, and he kindly consented to do that. So we have two more lectures on uh, what are the topics which we are going to cover on those two lectures? Yeah, so one is decision-making. We are going to talk in detail about palatal surgeries. We are going to talk detail about hypopharyngeal surgeries. And we are going to talk about skeletal surgeries. So that will be one session. And then the last session, we are going to cover completely about pediatric sleep apnea. Uh, how do you identify, how do you pick up pediatric sleep apnea? Because it is a completely different field. Uh, residual sleep apnea following um, adenotonsillectomy, how do you treat with these children, syndromic children, CP children, Down's babies? And then the last talk is going to be on complications of obstructive sleep apnea surgery. Yeah, yeah. so it covers the whole spectrum of OSA then. Yes. It will be, be sort of a reference uh, guide for every person who wants to, you know, answer the questions uh, uh, during the VIVA postgraduates, consultants who yes. want to operate. So yes. it's a brilliant uh, effort. I really thank you, uh, Dr. Srinivas. Thank you. For this thank wonderful you. series. Uh, it's already late. I'm sure you'll be tired after no, a long no day. Problem. Of, uh, no you know, problem. It's uh, a pleasure. This is what gives... In AIG Hospital. Uh, lovely. So all the lectures will be there in our YouTube channel, uh, Royal Pearl uh, ENT University channel. Please go through it. And um, these are all copyright uh, mark, so uh, you may not be able to, you know, download it. So thank you very much, uh, Srinivas Ji. Thanks. Thanks thank a you. lot. And uh, really, See you really soon. Great, great lecture. Uh, I'm sure everybody would have enjoyed it. I'll give you the feedback as soon as all the lectures thank get over. You. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night, sir. Good night. Good night.